still see a few folks joining. Um, and then Brian, I'll just check with you if we have a quorum here. Okay, Susan's here. Checking that. Just or just double check me, but I think I think we should be set there. I think so. And sorry, my sound was was off. I realized that was like... <laughs> perfect. So we'll get things started here. Everyone's seen the agenda. Um, call to order. And our first item here is uh, review and approval of the meeting minutes from February. Everyone's had a chance to review those. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from February. I'll second. All right. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Perfect. The motion carries. And then we can move on to housekeeping. And then the I assume that we'll roll into the DUR board update with that. Dr. Witten. Good morning. Um, so in March and April, the DUR board has met to review the theory about a pulmonary arterial hypertension in adult and children treatment. The board also met just last week to review the anti-obesity treatment in um, overweight and obese patient um, with consideration of any proposed policy about extending coverage for those treatment. That's all. Perfect. Thank you for that. So we'll move on to our next agenda item, which is from the Accountable Care Organization update. Um, so the report on methodologies for preferred drug list development. And first, uh, we have Dr. Tran from Healthy Choice, Health Choice. Excuse me. Uh, should I pull up my own slides or would you like to present the ones I submitted? It's up to you. I can present if you'd like, or you can present your own. Uh, if you could, that would be great. I don't know if I have presentation access. Yeah, give me just a second while I open that. Okay. All right. All right, while that's showing up on the screen, hi everyone, my name is Sam Tran, um, and I am with Health Choice Utah. Oh, sorry, it took a bit on my end to actually for it to show up. Sorry. <laughs> Might have been me. I can go um, back to the slide if you like. Oh, no, you're fine. That, that slide was great. So for Health Choice Utah, the PDL is developed and revised with input from the Medical Management Committee as well as the P&T Committee, um, pharmacists here at Health Choice Utah, as well as providers. We also refer to the uh, Utah Department of Health PDL um, frequently to refer for PDL coverage. Um, when it comes to new drug entities, formulations, and indications uh, specific to the pharmacy benefit, we review that regularly uh, I would say weekly, actually. 
All right, next slide. I can't tell if the BM scene. Is it for you? Didn't for me. Let me try going back. It did on my screen, so. Oh, there it goes. All right, so when it comes to communicating our PDL um, to the public, we do have a searchable formulary on our website at helpchoiceutah.com. And on there, you'll find that drugs are listed as preferred, non-formulary, carved out, or not covered. Um, we also have authorization forms and step therapy documentations posted on, the, on our website. Uh, when it comes to updates to our formulary, if it's a major update, uh, we do post it on our provider newsletter as well as through fax. If it's an update that will negatively impact our members, we do communicate that directly to the members. All right, next slide, please. Oh, great, it's advancing now. All right, for authorization criteria, uh, we build these criteria with the pharmacists as well as physicians. We look at clinical literature, um, clinical, clinical guidelines, input from medical specialists, our PBM, um, as well as manufacturer relationship teams, and also pharmacoeconomic data to help build those authorization criteria. And these criteria are then sent to our p &T committee for review and um, they review and approve the criteria or make recommendations for changes. Uh, when it comes to medications not included on the PDL, we do require prioritization and that will help direct drug therapy to the most clinically and cost-effective option available um, and also to ensure clinically appropriate care. All right, and last slide for me. Perfect, thank you. Uh, for our PNT committee, they're responsible for providing multidisciplinary input for review. Uh, they also promote appropriate drug use and positive member healthcare outcomes. Um, and they also make decisions to determine formulary inclusion. The committee meets at least quarterly um, and recommendations are presented to the committee and the committee then reviews and consider considers those recommendations for formulary consideration. In addition, we also look at medication efficacy, safety, uh, as well as cost effectiveness to also consider formulary decision um, in their overall review of medications. Um, when it comes to new drug approvals, we look to, like to look at those within 180 days, six months of market release. And currently our voting members in our com committee include the medical director, three physicians, and two pharmacists. All right, and that's all from me. Thank you so much for hearing me out. Uh, any questions or comments? Yes, I think I saw the show. Yes. Well, uh, Dr. Chen, thank you, uh, first of all. And uh, uh, I'm Joe with uh, Medicaid. Do you guys have a, uh, a, a formal policy on continuity of care, say, as a member moves from, from Select Health, for example, over, over to Healthy, Healthy Choice U? Do you have a continuity of care po policy? Yes, we do, of course. Um, let's see, that policy goes over when new to our plan. They have a particular amount of days um, in which we would consider a transition. We review their requests. Um, I don't have a policy at the top of my head, unfortunately, um, okay. but it is present. If you'd like to see it, um, I'd be happy to show that or um, give you a brief summary um, via email. Or if you'd like to hear about it now, I would try to pull it up and do my best there. Oh. Yeah, you can just, I would be, I think the state would be interested in that. So if you want, if you feel like sharing, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. You can just send that to our team email. It's Medicaid yeah. Pharmacy at Utah.gov. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sounds Thank great. You. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Next up, we have um, Dr. Britton from Healthy You. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Thank you. Do you have my slides to pull up? I do. 
give me just a second. I will share those. Thank you. Good morning, committee members. Thank you for having me today. I'm Laura Britton. I am the pharmacy director at Healthy You. You, um, I wish I had new and exciting information for you today, but after more than 10 years of doing this, I think our tried and true methods are, are still good and I'm going to present those to you today. All right, thank you. So our formulary is based on the fee-for-service preferred drug list structure and therapeutic categories. We have our drugs categorized as either preferred, non-formulary, carved out, or not covered. And those drugs that are not covered are Medicaid exclusions. So they're not um, something Healthy You decides not to cover. Next slide. We review new drugs that are come that come to market, new dosage forms, new indications on a weekly basis. And those recommendations for formulary inclusion or status on the formulary are presented to the University of Utah Health Plans Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee on a quarterly basis. We regularly consult the state preferred drug list PDL plus file on a regular basis so that we are making sure that we are in line for um, our contract. Next slide. The, as I mentioned, the PNT committee does make the determination on coverage of products on the formulary. It's comprised of university as well as outside primary care, specialty physicians, pharmacists, and nurses. And again, it meets at least quarterly. And they are responsible for developing, managing, updating, and administering the formulary. Next slide. We base our determinations for formulary based on clinical trials, treatment guidelines, pharmacoeconomic studies, FDA approved prescribing information, safety data, utilization data, and other outcomes data. Clinical trials and guidelines are considered when they are evidence-based, peer-reviewed, and relevant to clinical practice. The pharmacoeconomic data includes total cost of care. So not just looking at drug costs, but including administration fees and other uh, healthcare expenditures that we might incur while a member is receiving that treatment. And we consider the therapeutic advantages in terms of efficacy and safety. Next slide. And I did not see it advance. Oh, there we go. Oh. <laughs> All right. So we, drugs new to market, we make every effort to review those drugs within 90 days of release. However, we have a hard stop at 180 days, which is consistent with CMS guidelines. And at least annually, we review every therapeutic class to assure that we have the most up-to-date information for those. Next slide. <clears throat> As I mentioned previously, we meet weekly to make sure that our formulary is up to date. So it's dynamic, continually revised. It's posted real time on our Healthy You website. And any negative changes are communicated to our members and our prescribers within the contractual timeframes. Significant changes to the formulary are also posted in our provider newsletter. Next slide. We also have our Drug Utilization Review Board report to our Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee. And that board recommends prior authorization criteria, step therapy, and quantity, quantity limits to the PNT Committee. Next, next slide, sorry. <clears throat> our PA criteria are Again, reviewed by the PNT committee and approved or adjusted as necessary. Those criteria, again, are based on medical necessity, evidence based medicine, and pharmacoeconomics. Those criteria are posted online, and we regularly consult subject matter experts at the university or outside the university to assure that our criteria is in line with current uh, 
medical practice. Next slide. The prior authorization process, as all are probably aware, is for to assure that high risk, high dollar um, drugs are appropriately managed so that we maintain our fiscal responsibility to the state. <clears throat> all Medicaid covered medications are accessible to members no matter what the formulary status is. And there is a formal appeals process in place for members who disagree with our determinations. Our formulary is in compliance with ACA section 1557 regarding discrimination. Uh, next slide, I think that might be it. Thank you very much. So I'll entertain any questions that you might have. Thank you. I see a question. Uh, uh, Dr. Britton, thank you for coming in another uh, another year. So well done. Uh, <laughs> the same question for you. Do you guys have a, a continuity of care policy that you would be willing to share with, with the state <clears throat> as members transition? Certainly, we uh, are compliant with the state policy that we, in our contract, which requires us to have a 60-day transition as we review. And um, so we can supply that policy to you as well. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Next up, we have Dr. Goodrich from Molina. I'm here, good morning. And then I also sent in slides, do you have those? Yep, I'm pulling those up just to see. Thank you. There we go. My name is Heidi Goodrich. I'm the um, pharmacy manager. I manage the pharmacy benefits for Molina in Utah and Idaho. Next slide, please. Here we are. Uh, Molina Healthcare is a Fortune 500 company. We provide managed care um, services under Medicaid, Medicare, and the healthcare exchange plans in um, 21 states. And as of right now, we cover um, 5 million lives. We have a national pharmacy and therapeutics committee, and they are the clinical governing body for all dr drug related activities across the company. Um, it, this membership is made up of various physicians and pharmacists who practice in a variety of settings, and they are not employed by Molina Healthcare. Um, this committee meets at least quarterly, and they also report into our National Quality Improvement Committee. Um, and there are also various subcommittees that report up to the National PNT that I'm a part of, so I can communicate um, Utah specific requirements or needs as necessary. And that includes a Molina Policy Voting Committee, a DUR board, and also a PA core committee where we um, review and update the, our drug criteria. Next slide, please. Uh, the main three responsibilities of our national PNT are outlined here on the slide. Um, they help develop and maintain our drug formularies. Um, Utah is one of the states where we get to have uh, more leverage in controlling the formulary, also our marketplace formulary, and then our other states that follow um, state PDL um, files. And then they also review and approve utilization management. Um, so that would include um, different strategies such as PA sub therapy, quantity limits, and generic substitutions. Um, they also uh, monitor for quality indicators and also provide oversight of the DUR program. Um, lastly, they evaluate um, kind of data around use of our drug products and the P&T decisions. Next slide, please. Um, our preferred drug list covers many um, different drugs that try, treat a variety of diseases and medical conditions. We have two tiers, tier one being our preferred generics and tier two being our preferred brands. Any drugs that are not on, the, on our formulary can be requested for coverage through a, a prior authorization. Um, various utilization controls that um, 
we use that are also referenced on our formulary include subtherapy, agent quantity limits, prior authorization, um, generic drugs that have therapeutic equivalents with a brand name drug, and then we also follow the um, Utah Medicaid MME limits. Next slide. Uh, the various factors that we take into consideration for coverage, um, we first look at CMS rules and Utah Medicaid regulations, um, also their FDA-approved indications and dosage limits, um, safety and reported adverse events, um, quality. Um, we look at, you know, what the is considered to be the standards of treatments in our um, medical community, also efficacy. Um, formulary drugs that must show that they're proven and comparable efficacy to our non-formulary drugs. Um, drug utilization trends of clinically similar medications, the brand of generic pipeline, um, overall um, value as far as net cost, the market share, also um, the Medicaid rebate program, and then also the, uh, the potential impact on our members. And that concludes my presentation. Any questions? Dr. Goodrich, thank you. Uh, thank, oh, excuse me, same question. Continuity of care uh, that you uh, are comfortable sharing with the with us at the state, we'd, we'd be very interested in that. Yes, I will send that along to you guys. Thank you, thank you. I have a question too. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned that you have tier one generic, preferred generic drugs and tier two preferred brand drugs. So how does that, um, play out for members when something is uh, a preferred brand drugs, for example, something that does not have a generic available in the marketplace? Um, I would have to take a, a look at that. My understanding would be if that there are no generics and it would be a tier one, but with our Medicaid patients, the tiering uh, doesn't have as much of an effect on the copays that's really determined by their eligibility status as far as whether they have copays or not. But it's my understanding that if it is the only um, product available, then it would be tier one. Okay, thank you. I, I was a little confused, I guess, by the terminology. Tier Sorry. One. Yeah, it's it's those are kind of general rules, but there are exceptions. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Uh -huh. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Dr. Eshelman from Select Health. Good morning, everyone. Um, and I don't have any slides to share, um, but uh, I'm Sam Eshelman, and I'm the Government Formularies Manager uh, here at Select Health. Select Health is a not-for-profit organization, and it's part of an integrated system with Intermountain Health. Uh, Select Health and Intermountain work together with shared clinical integration, clinical programs, and patient initiatives. The programs and initiatives continue to provide patients high quality health care, as well as demonstrate our commitment to the community to help people live the healthiest lives possible. In working in collaboration, Select Health and Intermountain Health have developed and implemented clinical work groups and care process models. Uh, several examples of these include asthma, diabetes, hypertension, acute coronary syndrome, stroke, oncology, and pain. Uh, these care process manuals are reviewed or models. Apologies, are reviewed and updated regularly. Select Health has its own pharmacy and therapeutics committee, which meets monthly. The committee is comprised of local practicing physicians and pharmacists from a variety of clinical specialties. Based on their knowledge and experience, the physicians and pharmacists provide insight to local healthcare trends and understand how their decision impacts patients. Uh, just note that all committee members are required to sign a PNT committee conflict of interest disclosure. Select Health covers medications listed on the PDL Plus file from the state. All new drugs approved by the FDA have a determination made by the PNT committee within 90 days of release onto the market. Our formulary consists of four tiers. Tier one is generics, tier two is preferred brands, tier three is non-preferred brands, and tier four is specialty. A variety of factors are considered in the drug and medication class reviews which include uh, clinical efficacy or effectiveness, which includes the clinical trials, any clinical guidelines, um, and expert opinions. Safety special considerations um, would include appropriate access to medications, 
uh, additionally, dosage forms, any special handling needs, special populations, which would include pediatric, elderly, renal, or liver failure, our current drug utilizations, drug use evaluations, and finally, cost considerations. Based on the decisions of the Select Health PNT Committee, utilization management may include prior auth, step therapy, and or quantity limit restrictions for the covered medications. Utilization management may be added, removed, or modified as determined appropriate by the Select Health PNT Committee. Each therapeutic category is reviewed at least annually. Uh, that wraps it up for me. So thank you for your time this morning, and I'll take any questions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ashwin, just quickly, it's Joe at the state. Uh, do you have a continuity of care um, policy, and uh, would you be willing to share that with, with us in the pharmacy group? Uh, we Pharma? do. And I absolutely will. Um, Thank you. We also, in our policy, uh, have defined it as con uh, continuation of care is defined as evidence of the member being on the requested medication for a minimum of 60 out of the last 90 days, um, unless the medication is used emergently. Um, but I can uh, forward this on to the, cool. the email as well. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, hearing no more questions on the ACO update, we'll move on to our review of anti-obesity treatments from Dr. Lauren Heath. Great. Thank you. Let me just pull up the slides. Sorry, apparently system settings issue. Oh my gosh. Um, I put a PDF version of the slides if you'd like me to present. Sure, sorry. This is a new computer and now it's wanting me to uh, quit and reopen everything to <laughs> allow it to go. Sorry about that. It's okay, Lauren. All right, thanks, Brian, and sorry about that delay. So my name is Lauren, and today I'll be presenting information about weight management medications for the treatment of overweight or obesity. Next slide, please. Obesity is a chronic health condition of excess adiposity, which develops from many factors beyond personal choice, including environmental, socioeconomic, genetic, and psychologic contributors. In the U.S., obesity is a common condition that is estimated to affect 42% of adults and 20% of the pediatric population. Body mass index, abbreviated BMI, is a common population level tool to screen for excess body fat and to identify people at risk for weight-related adverse health complications. Refer to the table on the slide for classification of obesity and overweight by BMI for most populations. Next slide, please. Excess body fat increases the risk for developing weight-related complications, abbreviated WRCs, such as type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and osteoarthritis, along with many other conditions. Weight-associated health conditions contribute to increased disability and premature mortality among adults with obesity. Treatments aim to facilitate weight loss to improve or prevent WRCs. Treatment options include lifestyle changes, such as reduced caloric intake, increased exercise and behavioral interventions, medications, and metabolic or bariatric surgery. Lifestyle therapy is a cornerstone of treatment for all patients, but medications have a place in therapy for some patients since, many, uh, since they produce greater and more sustained weight loss compared to lifestyle changes alone. 
Because obesity contributors are multifactorial, experts generally recommend addressing structural, social, and economic contributors to obesity in addition to individualized treatment. Benefits of weight reduction among people with obesity can include prevention or improvement of WRCs, reduced risk for premature death, and improvement in quality of life. Weight reduction of 5% or more is a common treatment goal, yet benefits tend to increase with greater weight loss from baseline. So we reviewed nine approved medications indicated uh, for weight management. Except for one medication, Orlistat, weight management agents are thought to work by enhancing satiety or, or decreasing hunger, leading to reduced caloric intake. The reviewed agents can be categorized into two groups based on their FDA-approved duration for use, short-term or long-term. This slide summarizes information about the short-term agents, which are all pathomimetic amines for oral use in controlled substances. All are indicated for treatment of obesity. Two products, fentermine and fendimetrazine, are also approved for people with overweight with a BMI of 27 or greater and with at least one WRC. The dosing frequency for the short-term products varies from daily to three times daily, depending on the active ingredient and the unique formulation, such as if it's an immediate or extended release. All short-term agents are approved for people 17 years of age or older. Next slide, please. Agents approved for long-term or chronic use belong to various drug classes and were approved more recently than the short-term agents. All are indicated for treatment of obesity or overweight with a BMI of 27 or greater and with at least one weight-related complication. Products indicated for children 12 years or older, which includes all long-term agents except for naltrexone bupropion, are for the treatment of pediatric obesity. The GLP-1 receptor agonists, including liraglutide 3 mg as Sexenda and semaglutide 2.4 mg as Wagovi, are given subcutaneously, either daily for liraglutide or weekly for semaglutide. The remaining agents are given orally with frequencies ranging from daily for fentramine to pyramate to three times daily for Orlistat. Only fentramine to pyramate is a controlled substance. Next slide, please. This slide lists the organizations that published the most recent US guidelines addressing weight management pharmacotherapy for adults with obesity or overweight and for children with obesity. And I'll uh, summarize those guidelines. Uh, next slide, please. All three US guidelines support the option of adding weight management therapies to lifestyle interventions for adults with obesity or overweight with a BMI greater than or equal to 27 and a weight-related complication. Generally, uh, guidelines recognize obesity as a chronic condition and support using long-term adjunctive pharmacotherapy. Choice of pharmacotherapy should be individualized uh, considering unique risks and benefits. Next slide, please. Regarding adult guideline preferences for particular long-term use agents, all three guidelines recommend liraglutide, naltrexone bupropion, or fentramine topiramate as treatment options. Orlistat therapy is recommended by two guidelines, but conditionally recommended against by the AGA due to having the lowest magnitude of benefit, which may not outweigh adverse events for some patients. Semaglutide is only addressed by the AGA since other um, guidelines predated semaglutide's approval. The AGA performed a meta-analysis of the efficacy of treatment options and concluded that semaglutide may be the most effective based on indirect comparisons. Guidelines address short-term use weight management options differently. The AGA conditionally recommended treatment with fentramine or diethylpropion based on low quality evidence. They did not address benzphetamine or fendimetrazine. The VA concluded there was insufficient evidence to recommend for or against use of short-term agents for short-term, long-term, or intermittent weight management. 
and the AACE and ACE considered there to be insufficient evidence to recommend short-term pharmacotherapy in general. Next slide, please. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends offering weight management pharmacotherapy to adolescents 12 years of age or older with obesity as an adjunct to behavioral or lifestyle treatment and according to approved indications. While not a key action statement or at the level of a recommendation, the guideline noted that pharmacotherapy may be offered to children 8 to 11 years of age with obesity according to medication indications and the risk versus benefit profile. Similarly, the Endocrine Society recommends considering adjunctive pharmacotherapy for children or adolescents with obesity after failure of intensive lifestyle therapy. Neither guideline uh, provided recommendations or preferences for a particular weight management agent for an indicated pediatric patient. Next slide, please. So as part of this review, we uh, reviewed randomized control trials, abbreviated RCTs, comparing weight management agents to one another. No head-to-head -head trials were found for benzphetamine, fendimetrazine, or naltrexone bupropion, nor for agents uh, or for, for patients under 18 years of age. The two head-to-head -head open label RCTs compared semaglutide to liraglutide as an adjunct to lifestyle interventions for the treatment of adults with obesity. One of these trials also included adults with overweight and at least one WRC. In both trials, weekly semaglutide 2.4 milligrams or comparable daily doses was superior to liraglutide 3 milligrams daily for percent weight loss from baseline to 52 or 68 weeks. At 68 weeks, about 71% of patients who received weekly semaglutide lost 10% or more of their baseline body weight compared to about 26% of patients who received liraglutide. In the phase three trial, using the approved doses for both agents, gastrointestinal adverse events were the most frequent type of adverse event for both treatments. Numerically more patients in the liraglutide arm discontinued treatment due to adverse events than the semaglutide arm, but this may have been affected by the trial design. Slightly more patients receiving liraglutide had a serious adverse event than patients receiving semaglutide. Next slide, please. Liraglutide at a range of doses, including the target dose, was compared to recommended doses of Orlistat in combination with lifestyle interventions as treatments for adults with obesity in an open-label 20-week trial with long-term extension. At 20 weeks, liraglutide demonstrated significantly more weight loss than Orlistat. Approximately 28% of patients lost at least 10% of their baseline body weight with liraglutide compared to about 9% who received Orlistat. GI side effects were frequent with both treatments, with diarrhea being the most common GI side effect for Orlistat and vomiting and nausea being the most frequent uh, for liraglutide. At 20 weeks, slightly more patients discontinued treatment due to adverse events with liraglutide compared to Orlistat. At one year of follow-up, numerically more serious adverse events were reported with liraglutide compared to Orlistat. By one year, total non-serious psychiatric adverse events, such as insomnia, depressed mood, or anxiety, were numerically more frequent with liraglutide versus Orlistat. Next slide, please. A double-blinded six-month RCT compared sub-maximal doses of daily fentramine to equivalent doses of fentramine in combination with topiramate as adjunctive therapies to lifestyle interventions among adults with obesity. The combination product resulted in significantly greater weight loss than the equivalent doses of fentramine monotherapy at six months. The proportion of patients losing at least 10% of their body weight was about 41% with max doses of fentramine topiramate versus 21% with fentramine monotherapy. As expected, more fentramine associated adverse effects such as paresthesia, taste disturbances, or impaired attention were observed with the combination product versus with fentramine alone. The frequency of serious adverse events was relatively low and similar among all treatment arms. Next slide, please. 
The last head-to-head -head trial was a smaller, older RCT comparing the short-term agents Phentermine 30 milligrams and diethylpropion 75 milligrams in combination with caloric restriction among adults with an unspecified BMI, but a body weight uh, described to exceed their desired weight by at least 20%. Phentermine was superior to diethylpropion for weight loss at 12 weeks. The side effect profile was relatively similar between agents with some side effects occurring numerically more frequently with each agent as shown on this slide. No serious adverse events were reported. Next slide, please. The next slide summarizes contraindications and key labeled warnings or precautions for weight management agents. Products within the same class tend to have a similar safety profile. Contraindications for liraglutide and semaglutide include a history of certain thyroid cancers or endocrine dysplasia. Liraglutide is also contraindicated during pregnancy. Key warnings for the GLP-1 agonists are the risk for acute pancreatitis or acute gallbladder disease, kidney injury, especially during intravascular volume depletion, development of hypoglycemia, hypersensitivity reactions, and rare suicidal behavior observed in some liraglutide clinical trials. Naltrexone bupropion can increase blood pressure and heart rate and is contraindicated in people with uncontrolled hypertension. Owing to bupropion lowering the seizure threshold, naltrexone bupropion should not be used in people with increased risk for seizures or in people using other bupropion products. Other contraindications are chronic opioid use or use of MAOIs. Key warnings or precautions for naltrexone bupropion are suicidal ideation, hepatotoxicity, mania, angle closure glaucoma attacks, and hypersensitivity reactions. Phentermine topiramate is contraindicated during pregnancy, and since topiramate is a teratogen, a negative pregnancy test at baseline and during regular use is recommended. Other contraindications are glaucoma, hyperthyroidism, and MAOI usage. Key warnings or precautions with use of phentermine topiramate include severe, or not severe, sorry, several neuropsychiatric risks, ophthalmic adverse events, serious skin reactions, metabolic acidosis, kidney stones, hypoglycemia, and slowed linear growth in children 12 to 7 years old. Next slide, please. Orlistat is contraindicated during pregnancy and among people with chronic malabsorption syndrome or cholestasis. Key warnings or precautions for use of Orlistat are the risks of liver injury, oxalate nephrolithiasis or oxalate nephropathy with renal failure, cholelithiasis, drug-drug interactions with multiple medications, and since Orlistat interferes with absorption of some vitamins, supplementation with a daily might multivitamin is recommended. The short-term use agents carry similar safety concerns. They are contraindicated in patients who may be sensitive to sympathomimetic effects and patients with a history of drug abuse and in combination with MAOIs. Key warnings are to avoid use in combination with similar agents, the possibly increased risk for pulmonary hypertension and regurgitant cardiac valvulopathies, and the advisement to discontinue treatment if tolerance develops. Diethylpropion is structurally related to bupropion and carries a warning for seizure risk. Next slide, please. None of the weight management products are currently on the Utah Preferred Drug List or PDL since historically Utah state rules have not permitted Medicaid coverage of drugs for weight loss. The PDL does include liraglutide and semaglutide as the lower dose formulations approved for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. In particular, Victoza containing liraglutide is a preferred product and Ozempic containing semaglutide is non-preferred. If it is desired to add weight management products to the PDL, the board may consider recommending that at least one weight management uh, product FDA approved for long-term use in adults and children 12 years old or older be preferred. This recommendation could be satisfied by one product um, or by separate products. The rationale for recommending an agent approved for long-term use is that treatment guidelines generally support adjunctive long-term therapy and indica indicated patients to help achieve and maintain weight loss goals. 
Little clinical trial data supports long-term treatment with short-term use agents, although the AGA described that some prescribers may use diethylpropion or fentramine long-term off-label in adults in clinical practice. All right, that's all from me today. Thank you for listening. Thank you for that extensive review. And if there are any questions, we'll take those now. Hearing none, we can move on to the uh, public comment section. And first we have um, Dr. Simonetti. Um, from the University of Utah. Oops. Good morning, everyone. Just give me one second. I'm gonna, there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much for um, the opportunity uh, to speak um, with the community this morning. So I am a physician trained in internal medicine and fellowship trained in obesity medicine, and I also have been. I'm also board certified in both internal medicine and obesity medicine and have been practicing over the last 10 years. I'm currently the co-director of the comprehensive weight management here at the University of Utah. Um, so I just want to say that there's not only the rates of obesity increasing uh, over the last several years, but the severity of obesity is also on the rise in both the adult and the pediatric population. In clinic, we are seeing significant increase of this, the severity of obesity. You know, we're seeing BMIs in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, and we're seeing obesity-related complications at a much younger age, such as heart failure with reserve ejection fraction, type 2 diabetes, is leaf apnea, fatty liver. And lately, I have been seeing a significant increase in the numbers of fatty liver cirrhosis and patients now needing uh, liver transplant due to that. Um, also seeing uh, severe depression and overall decreasing quality of life of many of these patients. Um, and there are many reasons for that. We can include, you know, socioeconomic um, status uh, and access to healthy foods, in particular when we're talking about this population that is on Medicaid. Um, and some of those patients are so sick that they don't even qualify for surgery and certainly require medical treatment for um, they would be considered for surgery. I can tell you that um, there are patients who do not choose to have obesity, and they're often desperate to get help. Many feel trapped and hopeless with helping able to access some of the life-changing and life-saving medications. Um, I am to the point in clinic that I am wishing that my patients have diabetes so I can then offer them these very effective medications that we now have. Um, and however, unfortunately for many of them, they can't afford it and they can't get it and they would go to great lengths to get those medications and they are not able to. Um, and Dr. Kaur, who's here today, we work often together and, and, and the amount of work that it creates to write prior authorizations that then ended up just being denied. And we almost have a full-time staff in our clinic just to do that, to oftentimes tell patients that we can't provide the, the medications that they need and they can't afford to pay it. We know that obesity has long been recognized as a disease and as a chronic condition such as diabetes and heart disease that requires long-term care and comprehensive treatment approach. And as part of the standard of care of this disease includes anti-obesity medications and yet the health insurance are not covering for something that we know is effective and works well. And, um, and I can tell you story after story of patients that have been treated and those who can get access to treatment and the difference in their treatment um, outcomes. Um, I know last last week I mentioned I have a 20-year-old. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Simonetti, and <clears throat> apologize for neglecting to remind everyone the public comment is limited to three minutes apiece. <laughs> Are there any questions for Dr. Simonetti at this time? and we can gather them all at the end um, as well. So next we have from the Bariatric Medicine Institute, Dr. Moores. Thank you. I want to uh, applaud Lauren on her presentation. That was an excellent evidence-based presentation. And thank you, Dr. Simonetti, for your um, feedback as well. My name is Dr. Brian Morris. I'm a weight loss and foregut surgeon. I also carry specialized training in advanced therapeutic endoscopy. I have a background in biochemistry and molecular biology. I want to talk about three things today. One is the burden and cost of obesity. Number two, 
is what are the outcomes of effective treatment of obesity? And then the third is some of, some of the dilemmas and misinformation we face about obesity treatment. Of course, everyone knows obesity is on the rise. We're on track to be at 50% of Americans will be obese by 2030. There's a significant cost to this. If we look at the number one cost to Medicaid, it's dialysis care, which is $72,000 per year per patient. The number one cause of dialysis is type two diabetes and obesity is the number one risk factor for that. Also, we're seeing that um, liver transplantation is now the number one cause is fatty liver disease, which has replaced hepatitis C that costs $600,000 per procedure. We're also seeing that the number one cause of death in the United States is heart disease and cancer. Obesity is a risk factor for both of those. We've seen that the lifespan of Americans is decreasing from 80 to 79 to 78 to 77. We're the only number, or, um, first world country where that's happening. And again, I think that's primarily due to inadequate treatment of obesity. One of the dilemmas we have in obesity treatment is that we approach it backwards. Everything else in medicine, we offer you the best therapy first. If you had cancer, we would offer you surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation based on that cancer in whatever order and combination would work best. In obesity, we offer the least effective treatment first, diet and exercise. It is 5% effective at five years. Historically, medications were significantly better, but it was still only 25% successful. And that was with older medications where we were achieving three to 5% excess weight loss. With newer medications, we're seeing success rates between 60 to 80%, and we're seeing 10 to 20% excess weight loss. We see major health benefits for our patients with even 10% weight loss. And then of course, the last one, I'm biased, but surgery is the most effective option, and that's 95% effective at five years. But even surgeons are limited by insurance coverage. Our best option, the duodenal switch, currently is not covered by Medicaid. And so we have to offer options such as sleep gastrectomy, which we're starting to see recurrence rate of obesity around 20 to 30% at five years for the higher weight groups. And there's a scarcity of surgeons available. Only 1% of patients with obesity will ever see a bariatric surgeon. That leaves 99% of the patients with obesity left with the, the non-gold standard of therapy. Now, what are the outcomes of effective treatment of obesity? Well, when we effectively treat obesity, we can decrease cardiovascular disease and the severity of heart attacks by 50%. We can decrease the risk of more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Derek, Dr. Derek Grass from Novo Nordisk. Also, if anyone has any questions for Dr. Moores, uh, you want to forget that option. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, perfect. Uh, my name is Derek Grass, and I'm a pharmacist and medical account associate director with Novo Nordisk. I want to first thank you for opening up the conversation around obesity management and anti-obesity medications. According to the CDC, from 2000 to 2020, U.S. obesity and prevalence increased from 30 to 42 percent, with the prevalence of severe, severe obesity increasing to 9.2 percent. And obesity affects some groups more than others. Non-Hispanic Black adults had the highest age-adjusted prevalence of obesity at 49.9 percent, followed by Hispanic adults at 45.6 percent. Two, the CDC recognizes childhood obesity as a serious problem in the U.S. Between 2017 and 2020, obesity prevalence was 22% among adolescents. And like adults, the social determinants of health impact children and adolescents when it comes to the prevalence of obesity. When looking at the prevalence by state, CDC data shows that as of 2021, most states have obesity rates above 30%, with many having rates greater than 35%. Utah itself has shifted from the 25 to 30% range to now reporting 31% of the state as having obesity. Pre-pandemic, the expectation was that the U.S. was on a path to see 50% obesity prevalence by 2030. Sustained weight loss has been shown to promote clinically meaningful health outcomes, including potential improvement in some of the nearly 200 downstream comorbidities related to obesity, as well as a potential reduction in cardiovascular risk. Guidelines recommend lifestyle and behavioral intervention foundationally, followed by pharmacotherapy and or surgical treatment, depending on the patient and their level, uh, their risk of obesity-associated disease. 
For adults, guidelines from national endocrinology organizations recommend that pharmacotherapy be considered in patients as BMI reaches 27 with obesity-related comorbidities and should be considered more seriously once a patient's BMI reaches 30. For pediatric guidelines, the American Academy of Pediatrics indicates consideration of weight loss pharmacotherapy for adolescents 12 years and older according to medication indications, risks, benefits, and as an adjunct to healthy behavior and lifestyle treatment. These updated guidelines shift from a watchful waiting to a more active intervention approach. Therefore, we would like to ask the PT committee to recommend coverage of the anti obesity medication class on the Utah Medicaid preferred drug list. We have sent the committee information related to Novo Nordisk's anti obesity products, Saxenda and Wagovi, and would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we'd just like to open this time up if anyone has any questions for any of our public uh, comment. I, I did have a question, um, and this is kind of to the group at large here. Um, do we, I, I rec recognizing the GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists are a relatively new modality for this. Do we have five-year safety and efficacy data um, on that? And about what, where did that land in the percentages that you all are seeing? Yeah, I'd be happy to, to, to jump in here. We, we do have uh, the, the STEP clinical trials. Uh, one of those STEP trials is a, is a longer-term trial. Uh, safety data was was relatively similar to the the short term shorter term step trials, uh, and I'd be happy to to share that trial with this group and and send it over uh, after the meeting. And I have one thing to add too is that those drugs have been approved for diabetes for many years now, so we do have good data on on that as well. Perfect. And then along those lines, Dr. Simonetti. Would the patient be expected to then stay on it, or do you do you titrate off at some or taper off at some point? Or, I mean, you know, we had this discussion before. This is a chronic condition that requires chronic treatment, right? And the way sometimes I explain to patients is like the medication is helping us stepping on the brakes and decreasing the appetite into satiety. And if you're taking your foot off the brakes, there is going to be some level of increase in, in weight back. What we work with the patients is not just on the medication, but also in healthier lifestyle choices. So when they come to our program, they see a registered dietitian. We um, encourage for exercise. We have exercise physiology. So as patients lose weight, they also tend to feel better. Therefore, they would move more and do more. Um, but this is a chronic medication that patients are likely on it for a long term. Thank you very much. All right, uh, seeing if there's sounding like there's no other um, questions here for the group. Is that making sure I'm hearing that correctly? We'll kind of move on to our discussion section. So as we move into discussion, um, this class is a little different from other classes we've reviewed in PNT um, because currently Utah Medicaid cannot cover treatments for weight loss. Um, it would require a rule change. And um, so that's, you know, we're collecting all the information and, um, and, and We'll review that and consider what our options are for making changes to rule as to whether or not that can be allowed. So for the purposes of this discussion, this meeting, um, you know, perhaps any recommendations that are made could be um, made in such a manner that um, if coverage is allowed, um, you know, recommending X, Y, Z as equally safe and efficacious or not for inclusion on the PDL. Um, and, and that way, you know, we can take that recommendation and if coverage becomes an option, uh, then we can take those recommendations for um, 
consideration in creating a PDL class. Oh, great, thank you for that context, Brian. And do, just out of curiosity, do you happen to know when that rule was written or implemented or? I think it's been on the books uh, for a very long time. I, I was gonna say since the dawn of time, but that's probably pushing it a little bit. That's us kind of thinking that there, yeah, harkens from a time when the, when the treatment options were a little more, you know, kind of the amphetamine based class of medication. So, yeah. And, and just curious, any idea of whether that rule will be or reassessed or if there's a group looking to maybe change that or? Um, I, I think, you know, what, what is happening uh, behind the scenes, uh, I can't really address is it's more uh, you know what the process is is um you know it's utah administrative code which is rule yeah. um, i think dr hoffman had a comment too she's got her hand raised yes well mine's more of a question <laughs> than okay. a comment um I, I guess what is the role of this committee or drug utilization review committee in making a recommendation to pursue a change in rule and, and who has the authority to make those decisions? So when a rule change is made, so this body uh, makes recommendations for regarding safety and efficacy of drugs, particularly around uh, the preferred drug list. Um, the process for a rule change, uh, typically that started internally there's a um so there would be a proposed rule change and that would go out to uh, public notice public comment and and it really even before it got to that point it would go through um division leadership for approval as well um i know jen strohecker is aware of what we're doing and and she's aware of this rule so that's sort of the the process for how that would happen. Thanks, Joe. Perfect. If it's possible, I'd like to make a comment. Um, we do have, uh, Dr. Sloan, I'll let you determine if we have the uh, time. We do have a COI on file for Lillian. Um, okay, no problem then. Oh yeah, I think, yeah, if, if we'll certainly hear a brief comment from you, Dr. Core, if that's all right. Oh, I, I can wait. Um, I, I wasn't sure if my COI would be in time, so I can speak later, thank you. We do have your COI, so we're good. Yeah, I think you're good on the COI, so. So go ahead. Dr. Core, if you'd oh. like to, yeah. Okay, um, thank you. My name is Lillian Kaur. I'm um, a general cardiologist at the University of Utah, and I work with Dr. Juliana Simonetti in the Comprehensive Weight Management Program. My area of specialty and research clinically is obesity, heart failure, um, and um, essentially my concern is the increasing prevalence of heart failure admissions related to obesity. As you know, a heart failure admissions is one of the top five most expensive diagnostic codes. Um, and in our um, inpatient, um, as I work as an inpatient cardiologist and as an outpatient cardiologist, I can tell you that over the past decade, we are increasingly seeing obesity in more than 50% of the patients that we take care of with heart failure um, diagnoses. And, and the treatment of um, heart failure associated with obesity takes much longer and their length of stay is much longer and the morbidities and compromise of cardio pulmonary and renal systems um, make their care highly complex uh, with long-term kind of uh, post-discharge recovery issues um, including um, inability to get coverage for cardiac rehabilitation because most of these patients have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So from a degree, um, as already mentioned by Dr. Simonetti and Dr. Morris, you know, um, the treatment of obesity can impact and reduce the 
um, incidence and prevalence of heart failure, which is a long-term and extremely expensive diagnosis that we have trouble treating. And that's why um, I'm very interested in making sure that effective medications such as semaglutide is considered. In, some of you might already know that it is being uh, studied in the actual treatment of heart failure. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaur. Um, thank you for the expert commentary. This is fantastic to hear from so much uh, expertise locally. So thank you for that. And um, now we'll move on to the committee discussion portion, uh, unless anyone has any questions for Dr. Kaur. Great. Um, so given the, you know, as we're kind of, I think we all can agree um, this is certainly an issue that that um, needs to be addressed. And um, with the rule considerations here, I'm, I'm kind of struggling how to like come up with a motion there, Brian, but I'd say like um, what qualifier to use as we kind of say that, or if that needs to be part of our recommendation or um, in the motion itself. Um, I, I would maybe, use a qualifier or something to the effect of um, if coverage restrictions allow okay. then okay no yeah Th eloquent simple like that um i really appreciated dr heath's presentation as well um and agree with the recommendation uh or at least kind of where i'm coming from there we should be including one FDA approved uh, medication for um, to treat um, obesity with long term, uh, focusing on the long term portion. So let me, um, if coverage rules allow, um, include at least one weight management product FDA approved for long term use um, in adults. And then I'll do, I think, pediatric separate there. Um, to be included on the PDL or the preferred drug list? As many of these drugs are not approved for pediatric use, um, do we want to have the separate adult and pediatric the way we do with some classes, or do we want to focus more on um, long-term versus short-term uh, agents? Yeah, I could see. I I certainly could see carving it out that way as well. Um, yes, we will say. Um, in light of coverage restrictions, um, recommending including at least one weight management product FDA approved for long term use um, on the PDL. I second that. Thank you. And we'll take a vote on all in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstentions? Great. Motion carries. Can I ask a point of clarification? Was that motion limited to adults? No, I was fo um, focusing solely on long-term approval there. Thank you. And do we have, we don't have any, so we wouldn't have utilization data for the short-term products because that they wouldn't be covered, right? So, okay. Right. The only products that are covered are um, big Victoza, which are, would be off label. We do require prior authorization for non preferred uh, um, GLP 1 agonists. Both of those agents are non preferred. Um, based on the current rules, when a PA comes in and it is specifically for weight loss, we do have to deny those. Um, so we do cover them, but only for diabetes. And so um, essentially, at this time, utilization of these drugs for weight loss it is going to be nil.
Great. And then I guess just as a committee there, group, I seems to me we would focus on the long term just for you know, kind of treatment of the disease and long term course, like we wouldn't expect a short term agent to be used. So um, or to be, you know, long term effective. Is that something is a short term agent or what's the feeling of the group here with the evidence? Is that something we should be including on the PDL? Um, or would that I mean, be part of a stepwise? I think we could include them as part of the same class, but not necessarily have any, I don't think we need anything that says one of these drugs must be preferred. Okay. Uh, just, I, th I think based on the data we currently have, I don't think the um, outcomes suggest that that's the best approach. And that was my feeling as well, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I, I was getting from a lot of our expert commentary as well too that these are kind of not or the treatment should be focused elsewhere well I'm looking at those short-term short-term products so if anyone feels differently or wants to make a motion there uh, looks like Dr. Simonetti has a comment. Yeah, no, I was just going to make a, a quick comment. So when we're making choices for patients' treatment approach, obviously the GLP-1 seem to be the most effective. And oftentimes when you look at this population that's very sick, that does add on limitations on um, other medications that we can treat. But I will often also, if there's no other contraindication, I might also choose Contrave, which is the combination of well and naltrexone. Um, or sometimes the, you know, the, the combination of fentramine and topiramate. So I'm not sure, would you put a limitations in what can be used? Because sometimes if there's no contraindications, we can certainly, you know, depending on the patient, we might be able to use some of the other drugs. But obviously the GLP-1s have the most uh, robust data right now and to be the most effective. But uh, that being said, I do use other uh, medication options as well. Thank you for that. So, uh, just this is Joe with the state here. So, for Dr. Heath or Dr. Simonetti, is there data showing combination therapy? Do you get additive benefit with combination therapy? You mean more than one, like doing a GLP one plus? Exactly. I mean that 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 is being studied right now, and I do believe some. You know, in the future, we might see more of those studies, but I, I don't think there's really robust. Um, data on how some of the, the combination therapy, I know there's a group out of New York that has done some of those studies and has published in the combination of fentramine and using GLP-1s, but that's, you know, again, is much smaller data groups. And I ask because in Medicaid, one of our many rules is we can't pay for experimental treatments. So we have to be very evidence-based, mm -hmm. which is not surprising. Uh, Dr. Heath, any comment? Um, for our presentation, we didn't, you know, specifically look for evidence about combination versus single product, unless it's like the FDA approved fixed dose combination. So as we saw in the presentation, fentramine topiramate combination was superior for weight loss in that trial compared to fentramine monotherapy. Um, I'll just say I am also aware um, of a trial combining Orlistat and fentramine. Um, Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you. And I was, I did kind of loop the, the contrave and Qsimia, so the naltrexone bupropion and then the fentramine topiramate combination. Those are approved for long term management as well. So that I felt like would fall under um, kind of the previous motion there. Or it's like the, the short term ones. I think are either a single agent, um, diethylpropion, fentramine, solo. Um, and dimetrazine and uh, and sphetamine. So that and that, that's where I think I was going to classify those, just from the FDA short term versus long term. Um, does anyone feel so? Given those four: uh, diethylpropion, fentramine, fentametrazine, and um, benzphetamine. Any sort of do we want to make a motion about those short term inclusion on the PDL specifically? I, I don't think it's necessary. I mean, we'll look at the costs and uh, and all the factors when we when if we do uh, 
look at putting these on the PDL. And, you know, if it makes sense, we, you know, based on the current motion, we wouldn't be barred from having something as preferred. We would be, you know, it's recommended that we have at least one uh, long-term use agent, but that doesn't bar us from putting a short-term use medication. Um, I, I, I don't think we necessarily need something saying we must have, just again, because it's, the data is not as strong. That was my feeling as well, and just making sure the committee echoes that sentiment, if you will. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, for clarification. Um, of the long-term agents, um, one of them um, is only indicated for people 18 or older. The other ones um, may be used in, you know, adolescents 12 years of age or older. So I was just wondering, um, with the current recommendation, whether there was interest in um, addressing the pediatric population specifically or whether that was needed. Which agent was it again that is only approved in a... Uh, no, it's, it's a yeah. Okay. Thank you. And I think uh, the recommendation kind of for to include at least one, or in a, which is if that if I didn't highlight that out, they can include more than one. Um, and and typically, that um, the pediatric, the over 12, 12 and older would be taken into consideration there with that. Um, so Brian, if you think we need to highlight a pediatric one, um, but I felt like that was kind of general enough to include that population. I, I, I agree. And, and again, I would defer to the committee. No, thank you for your question, Dr. Heath there. Um, important distinction. Just soliciting the committee members, seeing if there's any any other points of discussion or any other motions sitting there. I do feel like the kind of general one we have would kind of meet meet the goals of this. And obviously there's some administrative things beyond the purview of our committee that would need to be addressed, but. All right, kind of hearing the uh, the nice Zoom meeting silence there. Um, so unless anyone has any other points they'd like to discuss, um, we'll see everyone. I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. I'll second that. So, McKay with the, the second there, thank you. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, I didn't. Uh, um, and then any abstentions? Perfect. That motion carries. We'll see everyone in September for our topic on insulin pumps. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. And thank you, Dr. Kaur, for that comment at the end there.